I made a big mistake with assembling the short block. There was one thing I did not do that was definitely overlooked and has caused me to reconfigure everything for the top end. Welcome back to Sword of Stock. Today is the day, ladies and gentlemen, our 426 budget stroker is finally gonna get its top end. Let's get to it. So the issue here is I did not confirm my deck height, believe it or not. You know, I went on the assumption that it was the standard 9.98 inches. Uh, that's really not the case, especially now with this block. From my assessment, this block is actually a 10.08, so it's a tenth taller than spec. I triple checked the measurements on the rotating assembly. That's, it's everything, right? Rods, pistons, crank, confirmed the stroke confirmed all the other measurements except the deck height. I just didn't do that. So hindsight's 2020, whatever, I'm still gonna work with it. What this means is my spec 0 0.020 deck height or deck clearance, I should say, that I was expecting uh, is actually 0.12, which is gonna kill my compression ratio in a naturally aspirated ratio or naturally aspirated configuration. Uh, not a problem. Knowing that, I was able to select the right parts of the top end to mitigate this and still get this build back on track. Now, usually everybody's first thought when they have a large deck clearance like this uh, is going to be, what's the thinnest head gasket can I get? And for these big block Mopars, the thinnest you can get is that steel shim, which comes in at a compressed height of, I believe, 0 0.019. I didn't want to do that. It's actually not recommended for the aluminum heads. Uh, instead, I went with a multi-layered steel gasket. Now this gasket has a compression height 0 0.027, so it's still going to help with compression quite a bit. Uh, way shorter than some of your traditional Felpro head gaskets, so that's going to help with compression. But it's also going to help seal some pretty extreme combustion chamber pressures. So these multi-layer steel gaskets. This is what a lot of the new cars are using. Uh, I've got this for the Viper V10 as well. They do a really good job at sealing. With the pistons that far in the hole, I had to shell out the cash and get some Metal Block E Streets. These were 1300 bucks shipped to my door. More importantly, they've got a 75cc combustion chamber, which is going to bring my compression up to a pump gas friendly 9 to 1. I decided to use ARP bolts instead of studs, keeping with the budget theme but also providing the strength in case I wanted to boost this later on. Now with these ARP bolts, they supply the assembly lube, but it's really important that you put a little bit of lube right at the head of the bolt for the washer to slide on. Now these washers are not omnidirectional. They have a bevel on one side, that's the side that goes towards the bolt head, and then the other side is just straight, no bevel. Bevel side always goes towards the head, kind of turn it so that that lubricant spread out along the washer. Throw some on the threads, of course. Push it in, and then it's ready to go in. All right, now it's time to torque them all down. Now, Edelbrock suggests 40, 55, and then 70 as your final torque sequence. I like to spread them out a little bit uh, for the sake of the difference between dynamic and static torque as well as because I've got an MLS head gasket. So I'm going to go with 30, 50, and 70 for my final torque yield. All right, now that I've got both heads on, I'm gonna go ahead and tackle the water pump housing. My oil pump is currently drying. I just painted that to match the engine block. This is the oil pump housing I've got. It's a Mopar Performance Unit. Uh, I believe Proform actually made it, but it's sold under Mopar. Um, it looks pretty decent, to be honest. I was actually a little skeptical of it. it cost around 120 bucks, but the quality looks pretty good. 
and it is wicked light. I mean, this is crazy light, especially the water pump and everything else combined. I mean, both the heads only weigh 60 pounds together, 30 pounds each. This 426, believe it or not, is actually like 250 pounds lighter than that all aluminum Viper V10. So, lighter than a small block. Nice and siliconed up. Yeah, I got a little bit overboard on this. I know. Do I need it? No, I do not. But I'm not doing this again. So, if that's what I gotta do to secure the pump and establish that I'm not having to screw with it later, and that's it. All right, so I am gonna go snug and a quarter, because that always works. All right, now that the water pump housing and water pump are on, I'm gonna keep letting the uh, oil pump dry. I you know, just got a couple coats of paint on that. Now I'm gonna tackle the lifters. Now this cam, if you remember, this cam and lifter set was already used in a dyno session. It was broken in. Um, didn't like the power specs on it, so they swapped it out for a bigger cam. So it was used from 1990, I believe. It's been sitting on a shelf ever since. So it's real critical that I match the lifters to the cam lobes that they already married to. I already have that done. Now it's time to put them back in. All right, I've been soaking the lifters for around 24 hours now. Just used a Glad Tubaware thing. Uh, I'm using a high zinc oil, so a break-in oil, and I've got them in order of installation soaking currently. So for easy access, of course I say easy and it's difficult. Just grab the lifter in question, slide it in place. There it goes. Just 15 more. In addition to matching these lifters with their prospective lobes, I'm also making sure they go up and down in that lifter bore without any resistance. That's an issue that a lot of people are having with these new parts today. Now before I put the intake on, while I've got visibility here, I do want to put this intermediate shaft in. Normally you could do this without having to take the intake off, but it's a lot easier being able to reach it from this perspective. So this little bugger, oh man, I hate these things. I had one of these fail on me, it snapped off right here where it engages in the fuel or the oil pump on a small block Mopar a week before my wedding, right before I was going to take uh, my new bride away from the church in a 68 Barracuda. Left me stranded on the side of the road and I didn't get to do that. So I always make sure that these are in good shape. Make sure that the wear, if any, is uh, acceptable. That there's no excessive overlap on it. That this is in good shape. This unit uh, has around 30,000 miles on it. Because I have a regular hydraulic cap or hydraulic flat tap at cam, I can use this. This is no problem. If I were to go with a roller setup, I'd have to get a bronze gear and a hardened shaft. Otherwise, this guy would snap in a matter of time. So, for installing this, I'm gonna make sure to put some assembly lube on the gear set here. Slides, actually, before I do that, I'll take some of this, put it on the shaft. Of course, I don't have the oil pump on right now, so that part doesn't even matter, but it's okay. Okay, flathead. There it goes. Perfect. Slid in real well. The distributor, of course, would be installed here, engaged in the top of that intermediate shaft, and that's how it works. All right, off camera, I actually went and grabbed some uh, grade eight bolts from Home Depot, threw on the oil pump, Three of those bolts were two and a half inch, and then the third one was three and a half. That's this long one right here behind the filter. So that is now installed. I was able to verify the seating of the intermediate shaft right down there. Threw some extra lube on it, just in preparation for first fire. 
Now I'm looking at this, I'm getting ready to put the intake on. Uh, I do have the push rods already ordered, I already verified the, uh, the distance needed. Um, got those on order, but for now I'm gonna go ahead and button up the top end just so I don't have to worry about dust or debris getting inside. All right, now before I do seal this up, I'm gonna go ahead and add some of my oil. Since this is a break-in, I'm using uh, some 2050 weight here, VR1, it's got high zinc concentrations. It's a racing oil, so it's great for break-ins. Used to use uh, the Shell Rotella, the diesel oils, but they've actually changed their formula as of recently. They don't include a ton of zinc anymore. In fact, they cut it down by half. So this is what I use now. If you haven't noticed already, I am a huge proprietor for RTV. I'm not gonna use too much of it though. This is a dry intake manifold, so it doesn't have any cooling going through it. It's not as big of a deal. You're really just sealing out the oil that could potentially leak. The dab in the corners. I'm gonna go up on the face just a little bit, mainly just so the gasket stays in place. There's no tab coming from the head gasket that holds the intake gasket in place like a small block. In fact, I don't even know if the stock big blocks do it, but I know this one obviously isn't. Okay, take my gaskets. Now, depending on the gasket you get, um, these are Felpros, they're pretty good. I've already matched them to the steel pan and the port sizes are the exact same. Otherwise, I'd come in and I'd trim it a little bit last thing you want to do is give up horsepower just because you've got a gasket that's smaller than it should be. Uh, but these ones are pretty good. They match uh, fairly evenly. So I'm just going to go ahead and sit this on here. Press it into the RTV that I laid down just so it holds it in place. I'm going to lay a pretty healthy bead here. Alright, now that I've shaped my pan a little bit, maybe it'll go around in the second take. Now these are the original, uh, I forget what we call them, fastener bars here, what do we call them, intake uh, plenum. Bar, whatever you call them, whatever these are. These are the originals, I just cleaned them up. I'm actually going to be using the intake that was on this engine when I first bought it. Keep in mind, I bought this engine going on five years ago, originally for the 69 Plymouth Barracuda. Decided to go in a different direction with that one, of course. I can get these bolts on. Sec. Ooh. I hate when that happens. This is why it's nice to have YouTube because you can just fast forward all this stuff. Don't have to worry about all the nuance of actually getting it to fit. Alright, now that I got the gaskets in place, time to set. This bad boy down. So the intake is on here nicely. Uh, like I mentioned, I really like these stainless steel bolts, but don't forget to put anises. You know, you got stainless steel going into an aluminum head. You don't want there to corrode and, or these to corrode and then freeze up on you. Don't want to ruin these nice heads. Now, I will say though, while they are nice bolts and nice hardware, they are a little bit difficult with this intake. You can see it's notched right here just so it can fit the bolt. This one actually went right up against the intake and scratched it. As you can see right in there, even marked up the bolts a little bit, but thankfully it did not cross thread. It fit in just nicely, uh, but I would caution you if you're gonna use these bolts or anything like this on an intake like this. This is an old school Edelbrock Torker 383. I don't even know how old it is. It was on the engine when I bought it. So I like it. I'm going to keep using it. And I've got some fancy hardware for it.
So keeping in line with the budget build, I'm just using the Summit brand distributor. Something I can use electronic ignition with, plug into a uh, MSD box if I wanted, or Summit brand box. Nothing too crazy here. Line up my chuck. Did make sure to put a good amount of uh, oil on the dizzy oil ring. Now, I know a lot of people are questioning whether or not this actually interferes, these heads. Uh, it doesn't. In fact, we got probably about a quarter inch. Let me show you. So, not that bad. Especially when I put the cap on, it's not going to interfere beyond these edges. So, I'm not too concerned about it. In fact, the cap is right here. We'll have to modify it to put the cap on, but... Still, so, no issue. I actually don't have the bracket to hold it down, down there. So I've got to order one. Uh, no biggie. At least this will plug the hole for now. All right, now the last thing I'm gonna show you all today is gonna be what's feeding this beast. Again, this is the budget build. Still want it to make around 500 horsepower or so. Uh, I have always been a big fan of Holly. Uh, they had this new AED high output carb set up that uh, has got some good reviews. These are nice long studs. I have a spacer. I'm not sure if I'll put the spacer on it or not. Depends. But for now, I'm going to leave it just like this as is. Uh, the cam, or excuse me, the cam, the carb even gives you a spec sheet, which is pretty nice. As you can see, I like the sizing, at least of the uh, primary and secondary jets. It's not a rebuilt unit, brand new core. Excited to see how this is going to run. Ultimately, how easy it's going to be or hard to tune, but uh, that'll be for another day. Now, I'm not going to show the rocker arm setup or the push rods just yet. Two reasons. One, push rods are actually on the way. Uh, had to do it right, measure them. You know, with these adjustable rockers, give that hint away. Uh, you can have some leeway in the size, but the push rod length is still pretty important. So I measured them, ordered them, they're en route. Uh, I will show you exactly what I'm doing for a rock arm setup on the next video. A whole one dedicated to it, as there are a lot of questions on this setup. Uh, I'll show you how it all fits. So for now, piggy bank horsepower challenge is effectively done. I just need to finish that piece, throw it on the dyno and see what she runs. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the long block assembly. If you got any comments, hints, any pointers, feel free to drop it in the comments. I read every single one and I really appreciate the insight. So thanks everybody.